Before we talk about crowded body tumors, let's take a step back and speak about the broader category of paragangliomas. Paraganglia are a cluster of neuroendocrine cells from neurocrest origin. They are dispersed in close association with the autonomic nervous system throughout the body. Tumors of these cells have been described in nearly every anatomic location and are referred to as paragangliomas. The most well-known, perhaps, is of the adrenal medulla, also known as the pheochromocytoma. Paragangliomas share a common histology of loosely clustered, centrally located chief cells and peripherally located sustanticular cells enveloped by thin vascular channels. One way to divide paragangliomas in your head is to think of them as those associated with sympathetic ganglia and those associated with parasympathetic ganglia, which are the predominant type found in the head and neck. Tumors of the crowded body constitute about 60% of head and neck paragangliomas, followed by those in the middle ear and then those associated with the vagus nerve. Now on to the main topic. The crowded body is a 3 to 5 millimeter reddish brown gland that sits posterior medially on the crowded bifurcation. Microscopically, the crowded body consists of chief cells and supporting cystanticular cells, no different than other paraganglia in the body. The role of the crowded body is to help regulate blood gases with alteration in ventilation rate. Despite being the most common paraganglia in the head and neck, crowded body tumors are very rare. They present around middle age, are benign, slow growing, and highly vascular. 80% arise sporadically. Some occur as a hyperplastic process in patients with chronic hypoxia, such as those who live in high altitudes. Up to 25% of cases have a familial component. In this group, patients often present younger and have bilateral tumors. One common issue is a defect in the succinate dehydrogenase complex, which is thought to lead to intracellular hypoxia. There are also several syndromic conditions, that including MAN2A, 2B, and F1 and VHL. One should consider genetic testing in patients who present young, have multiple tumors, or have a positive family history. In terms of presentation, these days most are discovered incidentally on imaging, so rarely do they present with advanced symptoms of cranial nerve palsy. Sometimes patients can present with a neck mass in the anterior triangle, but usually when the mass is three centimeters or more, it is rare but not uncommon to present with multicentric or bilateral tumors, so one should always be careful to rule those out. On physical exam, it is important to characterize the mass. In the literature, Fontaine's sign has been described uh, in which a mass it can be moved horizontally but not vertically due to fixation on the carotid vessels. A thorough neck exam and ear exam should be done for possible metastasis, bilateral tumors, or multicentric tumors. This is Fontaine's sign. It could be moved horizontally but not vertically. The diagnosis is based on imaging. Biopsies are generally avoided due to the hypervascularity of the tumor. On CT, there's a characteristic liar sign where the mass splays the external and internal carotid arteries, given the appearance of a liar. On MRI, there's a characteristic salt and pepper sign, which is indicative of hypervascularity of the mass. What else can a mass that is in between the internal carotid and external carotid be? It can be a vagal paraganglioma but they usually sit higher in the bifurcation and displace the internal carotid arteries anterior immediately. It could also be a schwannoma, which can also display the artery, similar to a carotid body tumor, but lack the hypervascularity of the paraganglioma, thus no salt and pepper sign on MRI. Here's an example of carotid body tumor on the left, displaying the internal carotid artery posteriorly, and a vagal paraganglioma on the right, displacing the internal carotid artery anteriorly. Generally speaking, the mainstay of treatment for carotid body tumors is surgery. However, this is an individualized decision, and it's not unreasonable to watch and wait, especially in an elderly asymptomatic patient. When thinking about surgery, it is important to ascertain the involvement of mass with adjacent vessels. In the Shamblin classification type 1, the tumor is non-adherent, localized, and easily resected. In type 2, the tumor is adherent or partially surrounds the vessels. In type 3, the tumor intimately surrounds or encases the vessels. It is in these types of tumors where a vein, prosthetic patch, or interposition graft may be needed to repair the internal or common carotid artery. Preoperative embolization is controversial with some studies demonstrating some benefit in reducing intra-op bleeding in tumors greater than 3 centimeters, but it should be noted that embolization does carry its own set of risks. A brief note on operative technique. 
the area of carotid body tumors can be divided into three zones. Zone one includes the carotid artery bifurcation and the adjacent vagus nerve. Zone two encompasses the external carotid artery, the overlying hypoglossal nerve, and the underlying superior laryngeal nerve. Zone three contains the internal carotid artery, the marginal mandibular nerve, the proximal hypoglossal nerve, the upper vagus nerve, the spinal accessory nerve, and the glossopharyngeal nerve. Most of the serious neurovascular injuries naturally occur in this crowded area, the most common injuries being to the vagus and the hypoglossal. A variety of incisions have been described, and one should use whichever will provide adequate exposure based on size and location. The initial step for safe resection is proximal and distal control of the carotid artery achieved with adequate exposure. Following that, the hypoglossal nerve is dissected from the tumor surface. Bipolar cautery is used to control bleeding on the tumor surface while dissection continues cranially in the subadventitial plane. Once the tumor is freed from the carotid bifurcation, the superior laryngeal nerve is identified posteriorly and tumor dissection is continued up along the internal carotid artery. Historically, dissection began under the bifurcation and continued caudal cranially. In the modified approach first described in 2008, dissection continues craniocaudally, which may allow for early proximal control of neurovascular structures of zone 3. The most common complication of the procedure are cranial nerve palsies, and up to 40% of patients will experience it at least temporarily. Other complications to worry about are strokes and death. Two interesting complications is a pseudoaneurysm due to dissection of the adventitia and bowel reflux failure, particularly in a patient who had bilateral manipulation of the vessels, which may present with tachycardia and hypertension 24 to 72 hours postoperative.